This is basically Teresa and Ruby if they were in Victorian England and were well written. Hi, welcome back to my channel. My name is Isabel and today I am to show you why you should give Vanity Fair a chance. You might have heard of a fashion magazine called Vanity Fair. You might have even heard of the Pilgrim's Progress. You might even know that William Thackeray was in dire need of money and his expertise was satire. But it doesn't matter if you don't know it because I will explain everything to you and hopefully you will be giving Vanity Fair a chance after this video. Vanity Fair by William Thackeray is now one of my favorite novels of all time and it was published in 1847 to 1848. It was a serialized Victorian novel that had as a subtitle pen and pencil sketches of English society. In this beginning I already find interesting because it's already alluding that how these characters are heavily caricatures and satire of English characters in literature, but also just in regular Victorian times. Some of the types that we have are the social climber, the ingenue, the rake, the rags to riches story. All of those types we encounter here and they are mocked, not only the characters, but you as a reader for trusting blindly in these stereotypes. When Vanity Fair was actually compiled and published in 1948 in the form of a book and not serialized, the subtitle was changed for a novel without a hero. And how do you imagine a novel without a hero is going to look like? Well, I'll show you. Vanity Fair follows the lives of Rebecca Sharp and Amelia Sedley since the moment they leave school until they are settled into their adult lives, so approximately three decades of their lives. However, that same premise could be challenged and it is challenged by the novel because we see the dangers of settling in and how women are expected, especially, to settle into the life that they're born, their social hierarchy, the family they're born into, and how that mere idea of settling in doesn't even make sense as life is like a wheel of fortune. And the moment that you are up, you can already see that there's going to be a moment when you're going to go down and all of this cyclical. And these same social dynamics are the main subject of interest to this novel. You might think, Rebecca, Amelia, but this is a novel without a hero, also without a heroine. Therefore, it's not about the character. The character is just the instrument for us to tackle these ideas and to bring this social criticism, to bring this, to bring these problems in society and just to exemplify them through a character. But it's not much about the character and the character never attempts to be real, even when we are within a realistic novel. And Becky Sharp is an orphan. She only has her beauty and her wits to secure a high position in this high power society. After entangling a good friendship with Amelia Sedley, she gets a glimpse of the type of life that she wants and she will do anything in her powers to earn the life that she knows that she deserves. But be sure to not typecast Miss Sharp because at least that's what the author does not want us to do as she is in a precarious situation where she has nowhere to go, no one to help her. And even when she is the main antagonist of our book, Rebecca is the most interesting figure out there, the most memorable, and someone so complex that at moments you wonder if she has believed everything that she tells to the world or who she really is. Behind all of her schemes, all of her planning, all of her manipulations, she awakes our emotions and our empathy because she shows us the realities of women who are like her who don't have the privileges that others possess to secure an easy way of life. Her main foil is Amelia Sedley. Amelia is, I mean, if this was a novel with a heroine, Amelia will 100% be that type of heroine for you, okay? She is so virtuous, so beautiful, so wealthy. She has never had to worry about all of these things that Becky Sharp is acutely aware of since the very beginning. So lovely, so virtuous, so entrapped in her own mind and her romantic notion that she doesn't know is that the guy that she marries, Osborne, is not as virtuous as her and he's actually a rake and disgusting jerk. She doesn't notice for decades, something that Rebecca quickly picked up on. And that is a problem with Amelia, that is her tragic flaw, that she lacks so much experience, just wits and intellect about the world and social clues that she just expects everyone to be exactly who they say they are, exactly who they portray. And that is something that mostly <laughs> we know already, 
that doesn't always correlate but Amelia is still very sheltered and we see through her how those types of girls also don't have anything really secured if they don't have the monetarily means to keep with that fantasy. These two characters might be foils and contradictions of one another, but they're also like friends, frenemies that show us the overall status of women. No matter how smart they are, how beautiful they are, or what family they come from, they are all under the same control and they're all being pawns in someone else's game. In this society, the only moment a woman can really shine and feel like she has any power is when she's looking for marriage. The first maybe two years that she is out in society and everyone sees her as the new shiny thing and everyone brings her like gifts and she's going to parties. That is the moment when she feels the most powerful and it all is a facade. They get married and the moment they get married, they are made aware that they had always been an object and they have always been a commodity for men. They go into the soulless life of women who are wives and mothers and they are no more interesting than a chair. The thing is, Becky is aware of this since the beginning. She doesn't have to discover this like Amelia does and most of the girls in this society do. She knows this. She knows this and she is trying to stop being a pawn and earn a seat at the table and be the one actually playing the game and not the one being played. And who are the actual players? You might be wondering who are those in power? Rich white men. Those are the ones in power and those are the ones who have all the strengths. The narrator is aware of this. Rebecca is aware of this. And in the case that you weren't, they made it clearly as daylight. For example, we have a male character who has a title who has a mansion and a lot of money and everything you might want and he is an idiot he has no manners no class he does whatever he wants he's vulgar and yet he will always have that position because he was born a male heir of his family but Rebecca Sharp the most intelligent person in this whole book will never get there because she's a woman I'm gonna take the liberty to read you a quote that the moment I read it I was like sold on this book page 123 in my edition we have all met people like this so allow me to read it for you vanity fair vanity fair here was a man who could not spell and did not care to read who had the habits of the cunning of a boar whose aim in life was pettifogging who never had a taste or emotion or enjoyment but was a sordid and foul and yet he had rank and honors and power somehow and was a dignitary of the land and a pillar of the state he was high sheriff and rode in a golden coach great minister and statesmen courted him and in vanity fair he had a higher place than the most brilliant genius or spotless virtue the brilliant genius that is rebecca sharp and the spotless virtue that is amelia no matter how much people, the patriarchy, want to pit women against each other and be like, you could either be this very virtuous Madonna or you can be a manipulative whore. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter because men are still at top and they want you to fight against each other. They want you to believe that there's a correct way of being a good woman and that is going to bring you everything you want. And actually it is not because men like this, we have all have met men like this that don't deserve anything of what they have, that don't work as hard as you, not even men, just people in general, men, women, that do not work as hard as you, that have not all the financial hardships that you do, that have started the race ahead of you, and you are running from behind already without shoes and your hands tied up behind your back. Like, that is how it is. And it is impossible to think that we all start in the same moment and we're all equal when markers of race, gender, class are already there to bring people behind and so on forward. And the knowledge of this could make you bitter, wouldn't it? Knowing that no matter what you do, you are never going to be on top. But Rebecca Sharp takes the challenge. She's like, well, what can I do? What can I possibly do to earn a way up? and we see her we see her journey we no matter how she ends she dares to try 
And to all of this, what is a Vanity Fair? Well, Thackeray didn't come up with a term. He's actually referring to John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress from 1678. Contemporary readers of Thackeray would have picked up on this reference as this was as it is one of the big pillars of English literature and of theology. But do not worry, you don't have to know it, I will explain it to you. In The Pilgrim's Progress, there is this guy, Christian, who makes a pilgrimage from his hometown that is in the city of destruction, the realm, the world, the, you know, the world. And he's going to the celestial city that is at the top of a mountain. And of course, he faces some trials, tribulations. He has a book with him that is supposed to represent the Bible that is leading him through his journey. And it's all this religious allegory of like the atonement of sins and how you can reach heaven. One of the stops that Christian makes is at a town called Vanity. And there, there is a fair. I know, very on your nose. This is similar, or this is referenced also in Pinocchio, at least the Disney version, when Pinocchio is turned into a donkey and then he's like at this uh, circus, like that never ends and there is like pleasure and they're going into like earthy sin and all of that. This is what the Vanity Fair is. The way that it plays in the novel and in literature as a whole is Vanity Fair is represented by the rich fear but it attracts the lower classes to go into this. So it is all a vicious circle as it doesn't respect really class division, but it is ruled by the rich. There in Vanity Fair, it's all the immoral things that you could ever think about, everything that is materialistic and that it has to do with luxury and pleasures and sin. That really is what Vanity Fair is and what the novel is always referring to. It's not that it's only called Vanity Fair. As like with the quote that I read for you, it is referenced over and over again, like, oh, Vanity Fair, this, Vanity Fair, is that such are the rules of Vanity Fair? These are the characters in Vanity Fair, Vanity Fair, this, Vanity Fair, that. You know, it is always coming in the back of the novel, in the back of your brain, because it is supposed to be this reference to the pilgrimage progress and how we're supposed to overcome this. A lot of people, once they stop at Vanity, like the city, they never leave and it is that metaphor or allegory of having to renounce this early pleasures forever that not a lot of people can do. So that is a central idea that we keep coming back to, Vanity Fair, what does Vanity Fair mean, how one gets out of Vanity Fair, if it's possible and what are the rules of it. But another central question is what is a girl supposed to do? It's not only with the character of Becky Sharp, but also with any other female characters that appear in this novel. And it is the situation of women or the woman question as it was later called in England. And not only about should women have rights, but what are the lives of women? What are the limitations? And what are their roles? Becky as an orphan, without wealth is very dependent on her first friendship with Amelia because this really opens doors to her and she gets to see the connections that are possible for her. Therefore, she learns how to pull every string she has and to amount the social capital. If she doesn't have economic capital, she can use the relationship that she has. She can use her beauty and her conversational talents to climb up because those are the resources that women have. We are inclined to dislike Becky because of all of these characteristics, because she's a social climber, because she betrays Amelia several times in the novel and she doesn't really have emotional connections with people, she deceives people, she acts in one way, but things in another. But can we really blame her? Can we really blame a character like that when we see the world that she lives in? And this is something that Vanity Fair brings in its satire in a humorous way, but also in a serious tone. What else can she do? And not only Becky, but Amelia. Amelia has been grown up with wealth and a good family name, and she thinks that everything in her life is gonna work out because why wouldn't it? But the moment that her father is ruined and they don't have a fortune anymore, everyone that she thought that loved her leaves her because she is not useful anymore. This is one of the first glimpses that Amelia has of how much of a commodity she is and how much money matters. What can we expect characters like this to do? And in the case of Amelia is, I didn't even think about it when I was reading the book because I was very much concerned about with Becky. but. How unfair it is for her too. She has been brought up with one idea of her life to just 
wake up and realize that everything that people found valuable in her wasn't about her it was about her money why her why someone that has always been good it she starts and ends the book being a complete virtuous woman someone that has always followed the rules and yet that doesn't secure her a proper happy ending she needs to put in the works and she needs to even get a bit of luck and help from becky to actually reach her happy ending and i know that some of the main concerns that people have entering classics like this is that we cannot impose contemporary notions of gender and what we think is right and good and how people we should talk about these relationships but i found that they are very modern notions of it and we can still be empathetic when we realize the concept the time the napoleonic wars the victorian ideals and wonder can i really judge these people of course you can we all have the ability but critically if we engage with this if we let ourselves go into the narrative even while we are suspicious of things we can find a lot of contemporary ideas and a lot of contemporary prejudices that date back to this time or even before and they are already been proving here to be problematic and this is why i specifically love victorian novels and thick novels like this that really let us explore the whole society that they're trying to portray because we believe really that we're so far beyond this we believe that we have moved past so much and we have we have had some things better for us in the condition of women but we are still a society marked so much by religious belief ideas of morality and ideas of gender and stereotypes and if we were really so evolved we couldn't connect with this novel it will be alien and foreign to us but the way that you can pinpoint and bring a contemporary example that's happening right now to something that is happening in this novel is the proof that we are haven't moved that far away <laughs> that what was problematic then it's still problematic now and we haven't solved it completely this is why you should really give vanity fair a chance because it's going to show you it's going to entertain you of course but it's also going to show you all of these notions that we think that we have moved past them and how we really in a very hypocritical life when we think that these things simply don't happen anymore or maybe you have the privilege to live in, I don't know, a first world country that is super developed and the majority of these things don't happen to you. What about the rest of the world? <laughs> what about all these people that don't have those privileges that you have? And what if I tell you that like in Vanity Fair, those privileges that you have might be taken away from you. Those things that you are so sure that are like constitutional rights for you, they could be taken away from you like this because we are not the game masters we are just pawns now i could talk about gender forever i really can. but if you're not just reading this for entertainment or your idea of entertainment is digesting books like i do you could really do a marxist reading of vanity fair and i think it would be very juicy and very interesting not just because of the social climbing not only because of the social hierarchies because most of the novels that we have reviewed in this channel from the Victorian era really focus in one social class. As if you have the pyramid here and the hierarchies, they really focus on this. Not everyone at the top, like the queen, but not the people at the bottom. What this novel does is that sometimes shows you a scene and you have, I don't know, Becky Sharp and her husband. And in the background, Hackery brings you there and tells you the maid was listening and the maid goes to tell the butler and the butler goes out and tells this other guy and how all of this is happening because the world is not made of people in this social hierarchy with those problems it sometimes shows you people from working class people who are eavesdropping and judging harshly all of this like first world problems that these people have it brings you a bigger picture moment if you're thinking about an essay topic i might suggest that that you analyze those moments with servants and working class people up here and what it says about them they're often getting screwed by those on the top 
that are not necessarily wealthier or better than them, but they are entitled to screwing them over. And I think those moments are so valuable because we don't find them very often in novels like this. And if I were to write an essay about that, that would be my topic. So I am giving my topic to you. I'm not gonna give you all the work because you have to do that, but at least now you have a topic idea. Now, the main reason why you should read Vanity Fair is not to do a literary criticism, to write a paper even though if you want to do that, fine. But it should be for pure entertainment because this is gold. Vanity Fair is a masterpiece and I don't know why more people don't talk about it. Why is it not everyone's favorite classic? I had the fortune of reading this with classmates and some of them didn't like it, so I am appalled by this. But at least with my own perspective and my own biases, Vanity Fair is a masterpiece and it's funny. That's why you should read it. Just for you to laugh, just to laugh about the ridiculous situations, ridiculous people, and just all of these poignant observations about society. If you love satirical pieces and like social criticism and just in a very enjoyable way, <laughs> Vanity Fair is for you. And why am I bringing this up? Because unless you're watching this video because you're in a class that requires you to read Vanity Fair, the truth is that you're probably hesitant about reading this because it is 800 pages because it was written in 1848 because maybe you googled it and it says something about the napoleonic wars and you're like eh, i don't know do it do it because it's funny and the root of its funniness i think it's the it's thackeray's style now keep in mind that i've only read vanity fair by thackeray so i don't know if this is his overall style i know that he was very prominent in a satirical periodical and that's probably where he gets all of this ideas from. But at least the style that is included in Vanity Fair and why it is so interesting to read is because the narrator does several interventions and he is clearly biased. In those interventions, it's not like Thackeray is letting you make your own idea about things. He clearly tells you, oh, but don't be too harsh on this character gent or gentle reader. Or, you know, this is Vanity Fair after all. What else can they do? He is very empathetical with characters, but sometimes he's like, oh, what a jerk of a character. Or, yeah, sorry, this chapter is going to be a bit dull, but we needed to move this story forward. And all of this, I've heard from my classmates that read it with me, that was very distracting for them because some people really want to be left alone to make their own ideas, which is great and yay for critical thinking. But the reason why the narrator has such a strong voice, I think, relates to his structure but just it is, but also because it's just so compelling to have as a companion. And this novel relies so much on gossip and people talking and the perceptions that are wrong, <laughs> but they are done and like transmitted from character to character, that it repeats it with you also as a reader. Talking about structure as well, I think that the biased narratorial voice is in some way justifiable once you reach the end of the book and you look back and you realize that the structure is as a puppet show. That is why the characters are caricaturized. They are not under the pretense of representing real people. They are characters in a puppet show. They are puppets. And the narrator then becomes the puppet master that you clearly see moving the strings from up here, but you don't notice while you are reading. So you might wonder in your reading time, well, why can't he just shut up? And that is because it's emulating the puppetry style of narration that allows the narrator and needs the narrator to direct the story, to direct us as audience. And for him to be hyper aware of this audience, there is not this pretense of other realist novels, that this is exactly what happens, that these people are representing reality. Because if we measure the characters we have under that scale, like let's say Middlemarch by George Eliot, of course these characters are not like real people are. Like a lot of things happen that you say, yeah, right. You know, and even things in Middlemarch are still parts of fiction because it is fiction and it skips things that are boring. And in, in Vanity Fair, instead of just skipping them, 
and acting like this is reality it clearly tells you well this is a puppet show this is fiction this is meant for you to laugh and to make satirical points that cannot be done in other forms of media another thing that i believe justifies this type of structure and just the narratorial voice that always interrupts and always is hyper aware of what readers say is that as i said vanity fair was serialized from almost two years time like dickens thackeray was aware of what the readers were saying he would hear the feedback of what was in the newspaper they will read it they will comment and thackeray will be listening and directing readers after a couple of chapters to be like okay i've heard that you people don't like becky but give the girl a chance or i know that you people think this is going to happen but actually no and this constant guiding the reader through the novel and crafting perfect chapters that always end in cliffhangers that I believe has been lost through time. Authors were very aware that you needed to leave a cliffhanger and sometimes you needed to give a little summary of what's happening but at the end of each chapter you need to somehow wrap the story nicely for the people to have to wait until the next installment but also to leave it in a cliffhanger so people can come back to it because they want something. And for me, that's the perfect chapter form. And I love when chapters are round and they're interesting and there's a reason why they end there. And as a novel that has so many characters, the mastery that Thackeray shows with dealing with so many timelines, so many characters, it is just masterful. And I say that because I think that the best way for you to read Vanity Fair is to focus on an amount of chapters and do not look at the overall picture because you're going to get frustrated when you see so many pages. And the way that you should approach it is how we approach TV shows or series. If you check out Netflix or whatever streaming platform you like prefer and you see a show with like eight season and with 20, like, I don't know, episodes per season, you focus on the ch episode. <laughs> like, and after you watch one episode, if it leaves you wanting more, you come back to it. And that is a remnant from the serialized novel. That is something that has been drawn from the Victorian times. And for example, one of my favorite cliffhangers without giving any spoilers is when there's a woman and she's hoping for her husband to come back from war because she wants to tell him that she's pregnant and that she loves him so much and blah, blah, blah. And then it says something like, little did she know that he was facing down on the dirt with a, like a bullet to his heart end of chapter and you're like what what what's what what what's she gonna do what's gonna happen like that has you screaming and wants you to come back for more even if you're tired even if sometimes it gets a bit dense i always look forward to my time reading vanity fair as i schedule a little bit each day and i hope that if you need a, an incentive for reading vanity fair this is it so let's review should you give vanity fair a chance Yes! Is it 800 pages long? Yes! But really, we need to stop being afraid of big books. Really, why do you care if it's long or short? You care if it's good, right? Well, this is good. Go ahead. Especially if you want to get into classics and you have this judgment or preconceived idea that classics are boring. I know that sometimes because of our time at school, we think that about classics because we were forced to read insert any classic that you had to read that you dislike i don't know moby dick i hate that and you say okay classic books are boring well this is not this is funny and <laughs> it's very hard to like take away that idea if it's really in your brain ingrained that classics are boring but i'm telling you this is not this is great this is amazing even though that i'm telling you that it is entertaining and enjoyable i'm gonna leave you with a few tips that help my reading of Vanity Fair and I hope will help you. First is a tip that I have for every book, but especially classics and long books. Separate your book. Separate it by as, I don't know, Vanity Fair has 67 chapters, if I remember correctly, and you can read a chapter a day. If you're not in a hurry, do that, 67 days. Why not? If you want to do two chapters a day, that's great, that's less the time. It doesn't really matter if you don't want to read each day, it could help you to be more disciplined and to like very get into the story, but just separate it in any way that you want. You can also separate it by pages. 
say i'm gonna read 20 pages a day but just make sure that when you make your division you get to the end of this chapter this is why i talked about chapters so much because if you stop in the middle of the chapter you're not gonna get this cliffhanger feeling you're not gonna get that like I want to come back feeling and the next chapter is going to like jump to someone else's storyline most likely so just don't do that <laughs> don't stop in the middle of a chapter just okay if you say 20 pages a day you say 20 plus whatever i need to finish this chapter or the closest chapter and the way i read it is i read three to four chapters a day and that was a perfect amount of pages for me those were amount the perfect amount of pages for me they were around 40 or 60 pages have in mind that i have to read this for class so i didn't have that much time and i think that scheduling will really help you also to like not get discouraged by the like amount of pages that there are just like okay so i have to read 20 pages two chapters that is easily obtainable and it like helps you to feel like you are like moving along i did this in a separate notebook but you can also you always have like extra pages at the end of your book or you can do whatever you want but just do a list of characters so do this like very detailed characteristics and who they are and like whatever whatever and like very minor characters that you know that they're super minor don't do that but just like main people and how are they connected it will really help you out keep in mind especially because some as i said that do come back later on but just so you know who these people are they also have nicknames so like you have rebecca becky sharp and then her last name when she gets married like all of this you need to keep track of that and it will help you if you have a list of it and on that note take notes <laughs> I don't color code like if you see this and you're like oh what does it mean each color doesn't mean anything I just go with the same you know how when you have in your flags and you have the color order I just go with the same color order but you can do whatever you want just take notes because it is a very dense novel where a lot of things happen and if you want to go back to it well you want to know specific scenes or specific passages that show a specific theme then it will be great if you took notes about it, right? Then for every other book, I have the 20 page or first chapter rule. I read the first 20 pages or the first chapter and then I decide if I like it or not. But for Vanity Fair and other longer novels, I would recommend the first five chapters, the first, I don't know, 50 pages, something like that. So you know what's happening, what's the style and then make your decision. And specifically at the beginning, if you can read a bit more or like longer sessions, it's gonna help you like understand and get the tone and get the style and just have you roll in faster and easier. Next, as usual, read with someone, a study buddy, someone you met on Instagram, our book club, your classmates, if you are reading this for a class, talk to them. You can talk to me, of course. Just someone that understands what you're going through. And as I said, a lot of things happen. And if you wait until the ending, there's just going to be so much material that you want to discuss or moments that you just want to like pick apart that you either forget or you don't have enough time. So if you do it consistently, it could also help you realize that the things that you're reading and the thoughts that you're having are going to be productive in a conversation, are going to start like, and they're going to store interesting ideas that might turn into essays if you need to write one, presentation topics, or just conversational points. I highly recommend you find a reading buddy. Finally, get a readable edition. And here I'm going to do a bit of a story. This edition of Vanity Fair, as you can see, quite old. I got this book the first week I moved to Switzerland in a secondhand bookstore. This is a book from 1968. It's old. As you can see, the font is not very readable. I got this book when I was browsing this first week because the title have always appealed to me. I kind of knew what the story was about and I just had a good feeling about it. I just needed an extra push in the right direction. And it came in the way that when I was looking for classes this semester, I saw it in one of the classes syllabus and I said, yes, we're going to enroll. We're going to actually read this. And then I already have the book. Now I will always treasure this edition because for me now it signals my beginning in Switzerland, this class that I had so much fun in, but I have to go back. If I had to think of what edition to get, I wouldn't get this. Not because it's bad, but it doesn't have notes. It doesn't have a big font. I feel like if you want to have the most of the book that you buy, I would recommend you buy the Northern edition or the new Penguin edition. This is Penguin, but from the 60s. 
and the new ones have a lot of introductory material complementary material the northern has essays in the background i think the northern also has the original images but also just having an ebook i like ebooks especially because this is kind of heavy to handle and to bring with you along but if you have an ebook it's also even easier to forget how many pages there are to enjoy it's up to you but keep it in mind for all of this and more i hope you give vanity fair a chance I'm right there with you. And if you have any other idea of classics that you want a type of video like this, we go a little bit deeper, just leave it in a comment too. Thanks for watching. I am Isabel. Keep reading. And when you're not, follow me on all my social media, link down below. I'll see you soon. Bye.